happy Wednesday already. Um, hope you guys are doing well. We are ready to start part three of Al Capone Does My Shirts. This is the final part to the book. So um, yesterday what we listened to in those two chapters was kind of a breakthrough for Moose's mom in the sense that um, she needs to start trusting Moose more about dealing with Natalie and the way he's been able to build a relationship with, with Natalie. So let's see how chap part three goes. Chapter 33, The Sun and the Moon. Monday, May 27th, 1935. As the day of Nat's interview approaches, my mother behaves as if her nerves have rotted and fallen apart like old rubber bands. She can't seem to sit still, can't stop moving, can't keep her eyes off Natalie. The day before Natalie's interview is her birthday. We have countless discussions about this. Should we celebrate it? Will the celebration throw Natalie off her schedule, or will skipping Natalie's birthday upset her more? What kind of food should Natalie eat this week? What should she wear? Should she have more or less button time? More or less time with Mrs. Kelly? More or less math time? More or less time with me? No detail is too small to be considered. And always we end up right where we start. We'll keep Natalie's schedule the same this week and have a small birthday celebration just like we always do. But every night my mother seems to have to decide this all over again. When Natalie's birthday finally arrives, my mother tries with all her considerable energy to make things appear normal. Remember, tomorrow is the interview, she tells me in a low voice. Mom, I roll my eyes. How could I possibly forget that? She sighs. You're right, I'm sorry. She pats my shoulder. Just keep her quiet today. There's extra lemon cake and, of course, her buttons. If she wants to play buttons all day long, it's perfectly fine with me. Just make sure she doesn't have one of her fits. She'll be a wreck tomorrow if she does. It takes her a week to get over one of those. I know, Mom, I know. And you have my number at the Liebs. My mom wiggles her hands into her gloves. Yes, Mom. Maybe I should stay home. She tugs her glove off. I hold my breath. I want my mom to stay home in the worst way. What if something goes wrong? Would you? I ask. She shakes her head. You're better with Natalie than I am. Her voice cracks. She doesn't look at me. She dabs at her eyes, her gloves back on now. I am? She nods, staring at the clasp of her purse. I'll be home early. Let's just pretend this is a normal day. Her voice is strained. She leaves without saying goodbye to Natalie or to me. Natalie is busy in her room. She's drawing pictures of the moon in all its phases. For the past few weeks, Natalie has been obsessed with the moon. This is strange for her. She's always been fascinated by the sun, but she doesn't like to do anything but watch it rise. She has never wanted to draw pictures of the sun, the moon, or anything else for that matter. For once, I get my book out without feeling bad about it. Natalie is content. I crack open David Copperfield and begin to read chapter one. I am born. The next thing I know, I hear pounding on the door. Natalie stops what she's doing. She doesn't look away from her page, but she doesn't move either, as if the pounding has frozen her solid. I think about not answering the door. There's no one I want to see. Not today. Other people could upset Natalie. The pounding doesn't stop. Natalie doesn't move except to dig her chin into her collarbone. Now it's quiet. No more knocking. The only sound is the wind blowing a door shut outside. Natalie seems to relax back into her work, but just as her pencil makes contact with the page, knock, thud, knock. Natalie's chin hits her collarbone and digs hard again. If this keeps up, it'll make her crazy. I open the door. It's Piper, her hat in her hand. An odd attitude for her. Go away, I tell her. Gee, thanks, she says. No offense, but I'm trying to keep Natalie quiet today. The interview is tomorrow. That's fine. I wanted to come in, not go out, Piper says. No, you need to stay out, I explain. Me? I'm not going to upset Natalie. She likes me, Piper says. I'm sorry, I say, my hand on the door. Piper scoffs. Can I at least say happy birthday? She looks so earnest, so sincere, smiling her sweet smile. She's even prettier without her hat. How did you know it was her birthday? Teresa told me. 
I don't agree to let her in, but I must be easing my grip of the door because the next thing I know, Piper is standing inside our living room and the door is closed behind her. Happy birthday, Natalie. Piper squats down to where Natalie is resting on her elbows. Birthday, Natalie, Natalie repeats. I feel a stab of pain when I hear this. Natalie has come a long way. I can tell because this sounds like the old Natalie. She isn't parroting like this hardly at all anymore. Nice moons you got there. Piper stands up again. Okay, she says. That's all I wanted to do. I feel my eyebrows creep up on my face. See? And you didn't trust me, Piper says as she brushes past me out the door. I watch her walk away. It feels like a vacuum has sucked the air out of our apartment. Piper is taking the air with her when she goes, and suddenly I want her to stay. I shut the door quick before I call back. Natalie is busy with her moons for another half hour, and I'm happily eating folded over bread and butter sandwiches on the couch, my book in my lap, my legs across the arm of the chair. I look at Natalie. She's fine. I look down at the book again, and then I hear paper ripping. Natalie is tearing up the moons she's made one by one, her chin jerking wildly down to her collarbone and up, down and up. Her eyes are beginning to storm over. Little torn pieces of paper float through the air, scattering everywhere. Uh Uh-oh. I slap my book closed and jump up. I shouldn't have let her do the moons. It was too new, too unfamiliar. Natalie! I say, forget those stupid old moons. Let's have some lemon cake. Lemon cake, Natalie. For a second, I have her. We'll sit down, we'll eat, it will all be fine. But then the forces inside her seem to collide. I can almost see the battle in her eyes. All at once, the storm seems to win. Her eyes are leaving. Natalie, outside, I scream. I jump in front of her, rushing to unlock the door. She follows me. She's trying, trying to fight it. Outside, Nat seems calmer. She walks hunched over. She still seems wild, like the fight is raging inside her, but the walking is helping, giving her someplace to go. Where do you want to go, Natalie? I ask. Nat says nothing. Okay, I tell her. We'll just walk. I shiver. I wish I'd remembered our jackets, but I'm afraid to stop her now. She looks too vulnerable, teetering on the edge, but she's following me. We'll walk until my mom gets home. Out on the parade grounds, we circle the cement once, twice. If she wants to walk in circles all afternoon, that's okay with me. Then abruptly, on the third rotation, Natalie breaks off and heads to the west stairs. I run to catch up to her and get in front, but she isn't following now. She's going her own way, and then suddenly Piper is there. I can't believe it. It's like she has a magnet in her head that draws her to trouble. What's the matter? She asks. Just out for a walk, I mutter. Piper gives me a funny look, then falls in line behind me. Natalie is walking fast. I skip in front of her and begin a slow U-turn. Natalie doesn't follow me. I grab her hand, but the angry way she shakes me off scares me. I don't dare do it again. She's walking down the west stairs now. Natalie, look, rocks, let's count them, I say jumping in front of her again, but she shoves past me. It's okay, let her go, Piper says from behind me. Shut up, Piper, I spit back at her. She wants to say goodbye, Piper says. Shut up, I said. Natalie walks on. Natalie, we don't need to go there anymore. We've already found a ball, I say. Natalie ignores me. Her head is down and she's walking fast, as if she's late for something. It's late. He won't come. We're okay. The words repeat in my head as if the sound will make it so. My pulse is beating in my ears. I feel Piper's arm on my arm. Let her go, Piper says. My feet slow down like they are suddenly too heavy to lift. I let Natalie get a few steps ahead. I can't do this anymore. I can't make it right. I don't even know what right is. I watch Natalie. I don't let her out of my sight, but I'm higher on the hill climbing a parallel course, and Piper is behind me. I breathe fast, short, shallow breaths. Nothing to worry about. See? See? He's not here. And then he is the black greased hair, the short bull bed nose, the deep pockmarked skin, the uneven walk. I could take him. I know I could. Natalie, he says, pleasure and warmth in his voice. 105, 105, 105, she says. How you've been, sweetie? He smiles at her. I stand up ready to crash down through the brush. How dare he? I feel a grip on my arm. Piper pulls me back down. 
I didn't think I'd get to see you again before you, they sh you shipped out, 105 says. How does he know? I ask Piper. About her? Piper snorts. The cons know everything about us. Onion's small. Quick, greasy hand takes hers. Natalie hates holding hands, I whisper. The tears sting my eyes. I stand up again, about to shout something, but nothing comes out. It's okay, Piper says. I stand still, quiet, shaking. Natalie is holding hands with a man convicted of some awful crime. It's so strange, so awful, and so normal. Natalie doesn't look weird. She's my older sister, a 16-year-old girl holding hands with a man not much older than she is. This is terrible, 